Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Radio Islam International. It is Reflections with Mawlana Suleiman Mullah, and today we continue with our program. And inshallah, Mawlana will be with us for our, for the rest of the week between the slot between 7 30 and 8. Mawlana, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair. Bismillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ba'd. Uh, there is a poem of Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah in which he says that Mihanu zamani kathira, Mihanu zamani kathira la tanqadi wa sururuhu ya'tika kal a'yadi. That the trials and the afflictions of this world never end. Mihanu zamani kathira la tanqadi wa sururuhu ya'tika kal a'yadi. While the happy moments and the blissful moments will only visit you occasionally like the two reeds that is the reality of life ya ayyuhal insanu innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan famulaqi o man you will toil and toil until ultimately you will meet your creator kam min abdin yarju al bashara fatabdu lahu al khasara wa kam min abdin yarju al ata fayabdu lahu al bala the arabic poet said that there are many people out there hoping for glad tidings. But on the contrary, uh, he has to contend with loss, with failure, with destruction. I was speaking to a friend of mine earlier today from uh, Sri Lanka and uh, we were talking about the financial strain and he said the economy is not bleeding. There's simply no economy. There's simply no economy. It's a fresh start. Start all together. Start all together. Sometimes a person is hoping, wishing, anticipating for a gift, for a reward, for an acknowledgement. And then he has to contend with a setback, with a snag, with a challenge. So that's the brutal truth. That's the reality. Uh, मैंने कहा हाल अच्छा हो तो सब अपने और हाल अच्छा न हो तो कोई अपना नहीं। When times are good, then yeah, everybody is with you. And when times are tough, then pretty much you are on yourself. And this is why we call out to one and all that during these tough times, uh, when 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 the things get tough, the tough get going. A believer displays unprecedented character at all times. Remember the time in Medina when there was drought and famine and there was economic crisis. And uh, people were in great panic and said, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, uh, before the evening of today, Allah will open up an avenue for you. And precisely to the glad tidings of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, a caravan had arrived in Medina laden with goods and laden with, uh, with, with wealth and food and provisions. And this belonged to Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu. So those that had the economic muscle, they came to Sayyidina Uthman and they said, listen, there's a crisis here, we will offer you something. So Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu said, what can you offer me? They said that uh, what landed you at 10 dirhams, we'll give you 11 dirhams. So Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu said, Qad zadani. I have a better offer on the table. They said, okay, we'll up our offer and we'll make it to 12. Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu said, Qad zadani. I have a better offer. And they went back and forth and they negotiated and they said, we can go up till 15. So you'll have 50% profit. So Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu said, Qad zadani, I have a better offer. So they said to Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu, Lam yabqa fil madinati tujjar. In Medina, there's nobody else that has might, cloud, muscle, wealth. It's us. So if we are not being nosy, who has offered you better? Because we're curious to know that because it's only us that can offer it. It's only us. And, and this was the beauty of Sahaba that uh, with their wealth, with their wealth, it was the source of them coming closer to Allah. So again, now my mind hops to something else, but again in the interest of what we're discussing. So the poor Sahaba came to the Prophet وسلم, and they said, ذَهَبَ أَهْلُ الدُّثُورِ بِالْأُجُورِ يَسُومُونَ كَمَا نَسُومُ وَيَتَصَدَّقُونَ بِفُضُولِ أَمْوَالِهِمْ O Nabi of Allah, we have a problem and that is the wealthy amongst us, they have secured all the reward and we don't have that options. Can you imagine back in the time of Sahaba, Wealth was synonymous to virtue. Today it's almost, and this is my words, ذَهَبَ أَهْلُ الدُّثُورِ بِالْفُجُورِ 
where owning wealth, and I'm not generalizing because there are many people whom Allah has blessed with phenomenal abilities, kindness, selflessness, generosity, and I've seen them. I've seen them across the globe, and may Allah increase them and grant them all goodness. Um, I've often mentioned about this one brother, and, and, and you know, may Allah preserve him. He has the habit of surprising people. So if he makes a commitment of giving an X amount of money, he will double his commitment and surprise. And when you ask him, like, you know, generally people make a commitment and then they under, uh, under deliver. That, that, that's the world in which we live, right? I'm sorry I committed. Subsequently, I realized. Um, and it's always better to under promise and over deliver than to over promise and under deliver. And that's one of the challenges we face in our marriages. Why are marriages breaking up? People are entering the institution of marriage with elevated hopes. So why the marriage broke up? Yeah, well, he's not like what I thought. Okay, so what you thought? Oh, well, I really thought the world. I thought he's going to do this for me. No, number one, if he went to go, you know what, fake this whole castle. You know, they say there's no problem building castles in the air. Uh, the problem is when you want to enter the castle. Huh? And there's no problem having castles in the air as long as you can put a foundation. So he tells me, he says, every time I surprise people, Allah surprises me. Every time I surprise people. And imagine Allah surprises you. Wow. And when Allah surprises, and may Allah bless my mom, she always tells me this year. She says, Allah will surprise you, my son. Because of your servitude to me, Allah will surprise you. And I've seen this so often in my life where unexpected, unanticipated, fuja'atul khair, you know, goodness just falling in your lap purely because of the du'as of my mom. May Allah grant her goodness and my parents uh, both, uh, you know, uh, together. So I was saying that in, in the time of the Sahaba, uh, goodness or wealth was synonymous to virtue. Dhahaba ahlu duthur bil ujur, right? And, 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 and today, unfortunately, it's the reverse. Having wealth is like I'm more exposed uh, to, to, to indulgence, uh, to enjoying, to, you know, somebody said during this lockdown, I don't know if it is uh, more scary to check my temperature or to weigh myself. <laughs> because for some people, lockdown is just you know what, uh, to sit and munch and eat and indulge. Um, I, I've been quoting these words of Ibrahim bin Adham, rahimahullah, where he said, I spent some time with the ulama and the mashayikh in, in, um, uh, in, in Lebanon, who was known as Sayyid al-Zuhad. His name was Abu Ishaq al-Tamimi. And in that, it was told to him that, uh, مَنْ يُكْثِرُ الْأَكْلَ لَا يَجِدُ لِلطَّاعَةِ لَذَّةِ وَمَنْ يُكْثِرُ النَّوْمَ لَا يَجِدُ لِلْعُمُرِ بَرَكَةِ that the one who uh, uh, eats a lot, من يكثر الطعام, who eats a lot, then such a person, لا يجد للطعام لذة, للعبادة لذة, he will not find, he will not find pleasure in, in worshipping Allah. In fact, uh, the Noon Misri, rahimahullah, used to say that ما شبع أحد إلا عصى أو هم بالمعصية. مَا شَبِعَ أَحَدٌ إِلَّا عَصَى أَوْ هَمَّ بِالْمَعْصِيَةِ Whenever the belly of the son of Adam was filled to its brim, either he committed a crime or he uh, entertained the thought of a crime. And how often we notice this year. In the month of Ramadan, I often say, you perform your dhuhr salah, you are hungry, but there's, there's meaning to it. And then at Maghrib, if you overindulge, you find that that whole spirit of, of Isha is gone, Tarawi. you lame, you lethargic, you bloated, you heavy, you uneasy. And that's the advice I always give to people that, um, you know, in, in Ramadan or whenever you perform in an Umrah, perform Umrah on a light tummy. Perform Umrah on a light tummy. And I promise the benefit of that is just unique. So anyway, I was saying to you that the companion said, Dhahaba ahlu duthur bil ujur. Uh, o Nabi of Allah, the wealthy are gone with reward. That they fast like us and they give charity. Then the Prophet ﷺ introduced them to recite the, this, the different tasbihat. And then the wealthy started uh, observing the, the recitation of the tasbihat. So they also emulated that and followed that. So the poor went back to the Prophet ﷺ. O Nabi of Allah, the wealthy companions, they fast as well. They recite the tasbihat as well and they give charity. And the Messenger ﷺ said, Dhalika fadlullah. This is the grace of Allah. So coming back to the narrative of Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu. 
um, they asked him that who has offered you better than us? He said, Zadani Allahu tabaraka wa ta'ala bi kulli dirhamin ashra. Allah has promised me minimum return of 10 on every dirham. Minimum 10. So why should I then negotiate with you? And then he gave the entire caravan in charity. He gave the entire caravan in charity. So they were not those who exploit. And again, a quick reflection. Uh, I remember once I was sitting in Australia in Perth years back and um, there were some fellow non-Muslims and the topic came about interest and usury and compound interest, etc. Do not eat interest, compound interest. Uh, so the person asking, but why is it that in Islam interest is forbidden? And I said in a nutshell, without going into all the details, Islam is based on a system of mutual kindness, care, empathy and sympathy. And the bloodline of a system of interest is to exploit and milk the desperation of another. So you have X amount of money in your reserves and the next person doesn't have the basics. I've been quoting this quite often where BBC carried an article and a news caption that the world's richest 1% has the same amount of wealth like the world's remaining 99%. Now, with such economic disparity, is this not going to automatically and inevitably breed a host of social evils in society? And hence, the teachings of Islam is that if Allah has given you wealth, that's a trust. That's a trust that Allah has given you. Like the ability that Allah has given me or given you or given anyone. This is a, 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 a bounty and a boon of Allah. There was this orator who used to conduct talks. And every time he used to conduct talks, people used to enjoy it and praise him. So he used to enjoy the praise. So someone said that's so in, uh, conceited about you. You know, people are praising you and you're feeling great about it. He said, no, no. I consider this a praise of Allah when they praise in me because this is a gift that Allah gave me. So praising me is actually praising Allah. So I am grateful to Allah that he's made me a means of people praising him. So a believer understands that every bounty that Allah has given him is a ni'mat from the Almighty. Uh, so as I was mentioning that uh, the, the Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anhu used the opportunity and he donated everything to better the people. Now, in a system of interest, you've got X amount. The next man is deprived of basic. To want to grow your money, you borrow it to him on the condition of, of, of um, him returning it with addition amount and, and surplus and, and exploiting him. And thereby making the poor poorer and outwardly making the wealthy wealthier. And I say outwardly because we know the wealth that grows through interest is not meaningful growth. But Islamically, we've been taught that when I borrow that money without any return or taking anything in lieu of it, then that man's happiness and dua will bring barakah in my life. That will bring happiness in my life. That will bring goodness. Man andara mu'siran aw wada'a anhu. The one who gives grace, gives grace to the debtor. Or he overlooks it and pardons it. I remember years ago, and I just have a flash, I had given a talk um, yeah, in one of the local masjids and I spoke about debts. I spoke about debts and I spoke about if you have debts, pay it. And if somebody is owing you money, then be lenient. And uh, I spoke about both of it. And subhanAllah, after the talk, two brothers phoned me, unknown to me, that one was the debtor and one was the creditor. And the creditor said that, you know what, I am owing money to so and so. And after listening to your talk, I have decided to clear out the entire debt. And, you know, it brings so much joy that the ummah has capacity. The ummah has capacity. And I, I just want to develop on that. Um, time is running out. Uh, again, on the aspect of, of, of barakah. Barakah, you know, as, as bleak as the moment is, as gloom and doom as the moment is, Allah remains in control. Allah remains in control. Uh, uh, one of the great scholars, uh, Marana Muhammad Umar, sahab, rahimahullah, used to say, he used to say, in an earthquake, only that amount of ants will die that Allah has decreed. In an earthquake, only leave alone humans, the number of ants that will die in an earthquake is also in the knowledge and by the will and the choice and the decree of the Almighty. It's not out of Allah's grasp and grip and control. So Allah is in absolute control. Uh, in Hayatul Sahaba, in the fourth volume, there is... Uh, there is a chapter on 
الرِّزْقُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ And there is a chapter on المَالُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ And there's many incidents there. So just to share two quick ones, again, to give hope to people that are taking strain and difficulty. Keep your focus, do your charity, and put your trust in the Almighty, and He will make an opening. He will make an opening. Uh, so there's an, uh, there's an incident mentioned there, المَالُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ Right? Or الرِّزْقُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ Sustenance from unanticipated avenues. And the famous incident of Jabir radiallahu anhu, where he says that uh, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam had sent us out in a campaign, the campaign of Ambar, وَأَمَّرَ uh, عَلَيْنَا Aba Ubaida and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had made Abu Ubaida ibn Jarrah the Amir. Fazawadna Jirabam min Tamar. We took a bag full of dates. Fakana Abu Ubaida Yu'tina Tamaratan Tamara. Every day from the bag of dates, uh, we are in campaign, we're in an expedition, the heat of Arabia, we are 300 in number, and the provisions we have is no more than a bag of dates. And Abu Ubaida ibn Jarrah. Uh, would ration us and give us one date a day. One date a day. So, فَتَكْفِينَا يَوْمَنَا إِلَى اللَّيْلِ We would live on that one date. From the morning till the evening, we would drink water and that would suffice. Right? Now, I often say, and, and I really don't want to digress too much here, as much as, as much as uh, we speak about the simplicity and uh, the contentment of Sahaba, it also speaks volumes on how nutritious one date is. Contrast one date with one polony, <laughs> right? Or, or one fracadel or, or, or something else that today that is, you know, processed meat that we eat and, and we consume. One date, the hukama have written, and I'm no doctor, but I've heard this from reliable uh, hukama and from my ustad in particular, that one date has the adequate nutrition to keep a person alive for 24 hours. So bare minimum, what you call in Arabic, قُوت ما لا يموت or ما يسود الرمق, which just keeps you afloat, just keeps you alive. So one date, suffice to say that the date was the provision that Allah made for Maryam radiallahu anha when giving birth. We have all these fancy soups that we like to give. But this was the divine provision. And yet again, I come across, I have a flash of another very profound reflection. So when Aisha radiallahu anha was asked, what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam live on? She said, al-aswadan, right? Which aswadan literally for the benefit of those who don't know Arabic means two black things. So it refers to dates and water. Now that obviously prompts the question that water is not black in color. Water is pure. It's uh, clear. So how do we refer to water as black? So the common translation of this is that uh, this was taghliban. So taghliban in Arabic means basically where you take the name of one and it overpowers the other. By way of example, you refer to Maghrib and Isha as Isha'ain. Right? The two night prayer, Atama, Atama, the night prayer, you refer to Maghrib and Isha as Isha'ain. Or you refer to the sun and the moon as Shamsain or Qamrain. So one is a sun, one is a moon, but you call both two moons, two suns. So you refer to this as, as Taghlib, where the name of one dominates the other. But, and I know ulama will appreciate this here, it's a basic fundamental principle that you do not migrate to a metaphorical interpretation when a literal translation is possible. So this is the general thing. Wherever something can be literally understood, then you always resort to the literal translation. So I heard from someone who heard from the great scholar, uh, Monana Saeed Ahmed, Rahimahullah Muhajir Madani, and he said that why take this in the context? Why take this in the context of, of, of Taghlib? Take Aswat from Sada Yasudu. And Sada Yasudu means to lead. Sayyidul Qawm. And if you take dates, then dates is the Sayyid of Ma'akulat. And if you take Ma'un, water, then it is the Sayyid of Mashrubat. This is such a phenomenal exploration. I was like, wow, man. This is just too amazing. So when Aisha radiallahu anha said, you know, and this is when you sit with the great scholars at their feet, then you learn from them. You know, this is, this is knowledge that's transmitted from the bosom. Knowledge that is transmitted from the bosom. 
So Aisha radiallahu anha said, Al-Aswadan. And Aswadan year could be taken in a literal context that both meant two leaders, right? That, that, that the dates is, is a leader in terms of ma'akulat and the water is, is a leader in terms of mashrubat. Uh, and and we, need to, we need to up our date supplement and we need to up our, our water supplement. And of course, we need to become more nutritious and we need to become more uh, organic. And uh, we need to eat things that are less processed and more natural and organic. So anyway, uh, you know, the mind is hopping from where to where. La ilaha illallah. We were speaking about... Uh, Ambar, the campaign of Ambar. So the companions went out, they had a bag of dates, and uh, Abu Ubaidah gave them one date, and he says, It would suffice for one day. We would drink water, and that was it. Imagine. And then the, camp, the, 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 the dates were exhausted and depleted. So what we used to do, kunna nadribu, the narration of Sahih Muslim, kunna nadribu bi'usiyyin al-khabat, thumma nabulluhu bilma. We would take our staff and our stick and strike the trees and then the leaves would fall. Then we would um, moisten it with water and then we would consume those leaves. We would consume those leaves and we would continue like this. Until we came to the ocean and Allah caused a massive fish to come out. And we lived That's the narration, right? Under this year. That Allah gives you sustenance from avenues that you know you cannot imagine. Um, so uh, Allah caused this amber fish to come out. It was so huge that in the eye socket of the fish, 13 people could sit. Read the narration. I don't want to go into the details. We lived off it for a month or close to a month. And we were 300 in number until we actually picked up weight. And then uh, we came back and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, this is sustenance that Allah has provided for you. If you have, give me some. So subhanallah, sustenance like this, min haythu la yahtasib, min haythu la yahtasib, from an avenue, you know, unexpected. And then there's a chapter there that speaks about al-mal min haythu la yahtasib, where Allah gives you wealth, wealth from avenues that are unexpected. So uh, I just have a flash of another verse of the Quran in the 22nd juz, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَنْفَقْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَهُوَ يُخْلِفُ Wow, look at, the, look at the exploration of the scholars of Tafsir. Whatever you spend, Allah will substitute it. Akhlafa yukhlifu ikhlaf means a replacement, a substitute. Um, I remember back in the years when I was teaching at Maktab in, in Houghton, in my early years post-graduation. So I was teaching some kids in the Maktab and I asked him, I said, you know what does a substitute mean? So he's like, yes, Ustad, I know. When uh, one player is injured, then you call a substitute. So I said, yeah, well, the connotations are not limited to sport. But OK, that's where he heard the word, understood the word and internalized the word. The connotations are much beyond that. And in Arabic, you have this beauty that if, if there is a fatah on the lam, right, then it refers to, um, in most instances, a noble substitute, a khalaf al-rashid. And if it has a, a sukoon, in Arabic grammar, then it refers to an undeserving replacement. So Allah speaks in the 16 Jews of the Anbiya alayhimu salatu was salam, that how noble they were. And then Allah says, فَخَلَفَ مِن بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ أَضَاعُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَاتَّبَعُوا الشَّهَوَاتِ فَسَوْفَ يَلْقَوْنَ غَيَّ That they were then uh, succeeded. And, and, and uh, you know, those that uh, followed thereafter were khalfun, they were not good people. Adarus salah, their first evil trait is they abandoned salah. Wattaba'u shahawat, and they followed a life of base desires. فَخَلَفَ مِن بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ وَرِثُ الْكِتَابَ يَأْخُذُونَ عَرَضَ هَذَا الْأَدْنَى Anyway, so there's an incident mentioned here. Abdurrahman ibn Yazid ibn Jabir says, uh, he says, حدثتني مولات أبي أمامة حدثتني مولات أبي أمامة The slave girl of Abu أمامة رضي الله عنه mentioned this to me that كان أبو أمامة يحب الصدقة أبو أمامة رضي الله عنه was a man who loved charity وكان يجمع لها لا إله إلا الله He used to save money to give charity 
like, like, have you ever heard of the save to buy this, to, you know, invest here? Save up so I can give more. I need to save up so I can help this person, so I can empower. وَمَا يَرُدُّ سَائِلًا وَلَوْ بِبَصْرَةٍ أو, أو, uh, بِبَصَلٍ أو تَمْرَةٍ أو بِشَيْءٍ مِمَّا يُوكَلْ He would never decline a beggar even if it was a simple fruit or an onion or something edible. So, فَأَتَاهُ سَائِلٌ وَقَدِ افْتَقَرَ مِنْ ذَلِكَ كُلِّهِ One day a beggar came and he was pretty much exhausted and depleted. He was dry. He just had three dinars left. So he gave the beggar one dinar. أَتَاهُ سَائِلٌ A second one came, he gave another dinar. The third one came, he gave the last dinar and he said that was it. So the slave girl of Abu Umama, Abu Nu'aym makes mention of the narration in Hilya and I read it in the fourth volume of Hayatu Sahaba under the chapter, Al-Mal min haythu la yahtasib, wealth from avenues that you don't perceive. So um, she said, I protested and I objected and I was not a Muslim. I said, you know what? You just give this charity and you don't think you're hungry, I'm hungry and there's nothing left at home. Wa kana sa'ima. Best part of it is on the day he gave his last dirham in charity, he himself was fasting. He put his head down for midday siesta and he fell off to sleep. When the adhan of dhuhr was sounded, I nudged him, he got up and he went for prayer. She said, I felt him sorry. I said, I know, I, you know what, said this to him, but I feel bad, I feel guilty. Um, so I took a loan from someone. I took a loan from someone and uh, I said, I'll prepare food for him. I prepared iftar. I bought some oil and I put it into the lantern. I put it into the lantern to burn the lantern. What did the Urdu poet say? Uh, wow wow so, I mean, it's a metaphorical, you've got to appreciate. Don't ask the lantern how much oil is left in it. Don't ask your soul how much time you have left. Ask those that have been wrapped up in the coffin. If you live a noble life, how peaceful and how tranquil and how serene it is to be in that coffin. How tranquil, how peaceful, how serene. Just to conclude this incident, we didn't even touch on any of the quotations that I intended speaking about. Um, so anyway, he went and then she prepared the food. She says, I went to make his bed neat. I find gold coins. I counted it. It was 300 gold coins. So I said to myself, Oh, okay, okay. He was giving charity because he knew what he left. So you know what, playing, playing the generous card, the selfless card, but he knew what he had under the mattress, literally, yeah, right? Uh, so that's why he did it. Anyway, when it was Maghrib time, he came in. He said, He entered the house, he seen food, he seen the light. He said, Subhanallah, this is the blessings of Allah. So the slave girl said, I stood up and I said, يَرْحَمُكَ اللَّهِ you left behind money and you didn't even tell me I had to go and borrow. So he said, what money are you talking about? So I took him to the bed and I moved it and I showed him. When he observed, he was astonished. He was perplexed. And I realized that he, he was uh, taken aback and this was something that he had not left behind. nor he was aware of. The narration goes like this. I stood up. I accepted Islam there. And I had a symbol of, of, of being a non-Muslim. I broke that up and I embraced Islam given his uh, charity and how Allah made divine provisions for him. Uh, Yazid ibn Jabir says, Once in my travel to Damascus, I entered the courtyard of the Masjid of Damascus. Right, the Amawi Mosque, the famous mosque, and I had the opportunity to go there where we know that Sayyidina Isa alayhi salatu was salam will descend. And when I got to the masjid in, in, in uh, Damascus, I found that in the courtyard of the masjid, 
تعلم النساء القرآن وتفقههن في الدين. It was the same slave girl of Abu Umama رضي الله عنها who had become a jurist in Islam and she was conducting discourses of Quran, Sunnah and Fiqh. So Subhanallah, look at the ripple effects of the generosity of Sayyidina Abu Umama رضي الله عنه. Anyway, um, our message is that uh, you know what we have hope in Allah and like they say that uh, the best nation is donation. وَصَلِّ اللَّهُمَّ وَسَلِّمْ عَلَى نَبِيِّنَا مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَأَصْحَابِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ وَالْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْع